What makes a church great? What makes for a great church? I mean, I love our church, but we need to ask that question as we're looking at This Is Us. And last week we looked at our vision, and that was part one, God's grander vision for who we are, that He is committed to His glory, and we're going to be committed to His glory. But today we're going to look at a little bit, we're going to bring the plane a little closer to the ground uh, to talk about what does that mean for us specifically here at Highland. So we need to ask that question to begin. You personally, if you are here visiting as a guest at our church or any church you visit, you need to ask that question. This is a good diagnostic question for you to think about. What makes a great church? What makes it to where a church you would say, man, that is a great church? I mean, it is, is it a, a nicely renovated big sanctuary? We love this. We loved doing what God has called us to do to renovate this and, and to give the generosity through finances to be able to do it without taking uh, on a loan and things like that. We love that. But does a nicely renovated sanctuary like this, does that make a great church? Does the fact that we never have to have budget discussions on if we're going to make budget or not, does that make a great church? That we have money rolling in like crazy, we can do whatever we want to do, and we never have to have those conversations. I never have to preach on money or anything like that, right? Does that make a great church when we can look at our bank account and say, wow, we have everything we ever would want. Does that make a great church? Does the fact that this place is consistently full of people like you, or when we look at our children and that's growing, or we look at our student ministries and that's growing, and we look all through the church and the church is growing with people in the building left and right, and that's wonderful. We love seeing that. But does that make a great church? Does that make that church great? Well, to answer that question, I'm going to ask a little bit of help from Libby, our children's director. So she has made a video because there's a lot to be said in the idea of cooking. And so in cooking, it takes art and a lot of skill. But even the most amateurish baker, not cooking, but in this one, baking, if they follow the recipe, typically it comes out with a good success. Wouldn't you agree? I'd agree with that. So, Libby, if you would turn your attention to the screen, she has her baking video for us to see this morning as we think about that question, what makes a church great? Hey guys! So I woke up this morning and I was craving some chocolate chip cookies. So I decided that I am going to make chocolate chip cookies. I picked up all the supplies I needed and I think I am ready to make some cookies. Okay, so whenever I got all of my ingredients this morning, I started thinking, if cookies are so yummy and delicious, maybe that means that all the ingredients that goes into the cookies are delicious. So we are going to get started and start making the cookies. But first, I gotta get ready. Okay, now that I am ready, we can start making the cookies. Now the first thing that I need is three cups of flour. Flour. So if cookies are so yummy and delicious, then that means the flour must be yummy and delicious, right? So, let's see how yummy flour is. Note to self, flour does not taste good. So it calls for three cups of flour. I have my cup. Let's see, there's, okay, flour, check. Okay, my next ingredient is one teaspoon of baking soda. So I have my baking soda. And since baking soda is in cookies, then maybe baking soda tastes good, or at least better than the flour. So let's try it. Oh, 
Baking soda doesn't taste good either. Okay, and then three fourths of a teaspoon of kosher, kosher, kosher salt. Okay, and since salt is in cookies, then maybe the salt tastes good, right? So, three fourths of a teaspoon of salt. Okay, and now we mix all three of these ingredients together. My thing in my bob to stir it, and we gonna stir it. Okay, so the next thing that I need is two sticks of butter. So. If butter is such a prominent ingredient, because this is a lot of butter and I need two of these, then the butter must taste good by itself, right? again. And now we wait until it's all combined together. Okay, now that it's all mixed together and looking so yummy, now it's time to scoop them into this and put it on the cookie tray. Cookies look perfect. So let me pull them out. Okay, are you ready to see the final product? Mmm, so much better. I can vouch for that, they were really good. I'm sure that was the first of many baking videos that she's going to do for us. <laughs> now, what she's doing proves a really good point because, I mean, you can take some of those ingredients and by themselves, they're not really that good. You have to take them all in combination. You have to put them together and you have to follow the recipe of what's been giving and all of a sudden the cookie together combined makes a really good product. It was very tasty. She gave them to the office and, and they were wonderful. They, she did a really good job. But by themselves, they don't work nearly as good. What makes a great church? Those things are wonderful things that we mentioned a while ago about the building and the budgets and the people and all those things. Those are wonderful things. But if you try to maximize only on one of those things and you miss the whole point of what God is trying to do about what makes a good church, they're not going to come out very well. In fact, it's going to make the church more sour or distasteful in the world, not something that is uh, good for the world. And so the question is, what makes for a great church? What are the ingredients that God has put together that says, if you will do this, this, and this, this will be a great church? I hope you want to know the answer to that question. I did. And so I want to invite you to 1 Thessalonians. It's a small letter written by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament there. And it was a letter that he wrote to the Thessalonian Christians. Now this church, it was very unique because in this in this church, uh, he planted this church on his second missionary journey. He came, he and Silas and Luke had came from Philippi where they had spent a night in the jail, if you remember that, and the earthquake happened and they, were, and they left the city. Well, they leave Philippi and they're on this highway and they go to Thessalonica. And when they get there, Paul begins to do what he always does. He found the local synagogue, which was at least 10 Jewish men together. Um, and so he found that gathering. This city was a very important city 
in the empire. It was in southern Macedonia, and it's on the north coast of the Aegean Sea. And it was an extremely wealthy city. It had a huge port there. So it was a major city of that time. There were many, many Greek, speak, Greek people there, but there was a good bit of Jewish community there. And so Paul went into the synagogue, and he was only there for three Sabbaths. That means he was there for three weeks. And he's teaching in the synagogues about that Jesus is the Messiah. And he would show them from Scripture about how that happens and, and that, what that means for them. And it says that many of the uh, people believed, some Jews, but also a lot of Greeks and even some prominent women. There were some very wealthy people that came to faith in Christ due to those three weeks of ministry. The problem is Paul had to leave. He got ran out of town again. Three weeks of ministry. He's seeing people come to faith in Jesus. They saw what Paul did. For three weeks, things were awesome. Now put yourself into their position. You're a small, infantile church that barely understood what just happened. Even in all the teaching that Paul had given, they still barely understood what really went on. And yet the mission had been given to them, reach your city. How would you have felt? The guy who put all this together, He's not here anymore. And so Paul wrote this letter to them to encourage them to keep doing what they were doing. But I want you to notice something very specific that Paul says in the introduction to his letter. Because it does not matter. The impact of a church is not determined by the size of the church. The impact of a church in its city is not determined by how much money or how many people or anything else they have coming into it. The impact of a church is measured by the church who knows Christ as Lord and Savior and is one who is growing in Christ. I want you to listen in verse 2 and verse 3 of what Paul begins his letter in. He says, We always thank God for all of you, making mention in our, of you constantly in our prayers. And here it is, verse 3, our focus verse. We recall in the presence of God and fa of our God and Father. Here it is, your work produced by faith... Your labor motivated by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's recipe for what makes a church great. This is the making of a great church. There are three ingredients that must be evident in every local church for them to make an impact in their city and around the world. And I want to share those real briefly with you. Look at number one, it's the what, the what. Faith that produces work, faith that produces work. Our faith in Christ produces our work for Christ. Our work for Christ does not produce our faith in Christ. We do not work for faith, we work from it. Because we have been saved, because we have received God's grace, then we in turn, begin to do what God has called us to do. Look what he says. He says, we, we recall in the presence of God, our Father, the very first thing, your work produced by faith. That's the first ingredient. Paul says he thanks God for this church because of their work produced by faith. The CSB, our translation that we're using this morning, is that your, your, your work produced by faith there are other translations that, that take out some of that and they use your work of faith. I think that uh, that gets to a little convoluted understanding of faith in the Bible. Um, so we want to be careful of that. Not that those are bad translations. That's just how they have translated. I think the CSB gets to the heart of it. It's that their faith was producing their work, that their faith is not a work in itself. It is producing the work that they are doing for God. And so what kind of work were they producing? How was this produced by faith? Well, the very first thing was not something they produced, but was produced in them because of Jesus. It's the work or the fruit of salvation. In verse 9, if you go down to verse 9, same chapter, he says, they report other people that are seeing you, that know about your circumstances, they report how you turn to God 
from idols to serve the living and true God, that they had come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they had placed their faith in Christ, that when Paul was preaching to them, they heard the gospel and they believed the gospel. And when they did, they were saved. They were put into a right relationship with God and it produced this fruit of salvation. See, faith is not a work, but it produces work. Faith is a belief in the Bible, not a work of what we do. It is a position of trust, not a work, or else we would, guess what? Boast in our faith. We would boast in our work. Have you ever heard of the word of faith movement? If you name it, you claim it. If you're not getting healthy and you're not well and God's not blessing you, it's on you because you have weak faith. That's a work of faith mentality. That's not what we see in the scriptures. The Thessalonian people, man, they heard Paul preach and they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Paul even reminds the Galatian believers the same thing, Galatians 2, 16. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, not by anything you can do, not by any stretch of the imagination that I can do certain things and God will save me. We're not justified by that. We're justified, we're put into a right relationship by faith in Jesus Christ, he says. I mean, think about John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that whoever, what? Believes, not comes to church, not reads their Bible every day, not gives all of their money, not serves the poor all the time, not raises their kids, right? But believes. For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting eternal life. It is on faith. Faith is the vessel, the avenue in which God's grace travels to our heart, that we receive that. But it wasn't just the fruit of salvation. It's also that they were producing, Jesus was producing fruit, the spiritual growth in them, the fruit of sanctification. If you go down to chapter two, verse 13, Paul says this, he says, this is why we constantly thank God. Because when you receive the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is the word of God, which also works effectively in you who, what? Believe. The word believe there is in the present active plural tense of the meaning. What does that mean? It means that when Paul preached, it wasn't just they heard the gospel and believed it one time and said, I'm saved, check, move on. It's that every time they read, every time they read one of Paul's letters, every time they remembered the gospel, every time they thought about Jesus, they continued to believe the gospel. It continued to change them. They continued to go back and back and back to the gospel. I mean, God wants every single one of you that know him as Lord and Savior to continue to grow in him as, a, as in Christ likeness. This happens when we keep going back to the heart of the gospel, the cross. Now, I hope if I ask this question, you would say yes. But do you want to grow as a Christian? Do you want to see your spiritual life continue to progress? Do you want to grow in Christ likeness? Do you want God to use you? Well, I'm gonna show you two pictures in just a moment. And, and the first picture is the problem of why growth is not happening. And the second is gonna be the solution on how growth is to happen. So here's the first picture. And I, I'm, I may have to explain a little bit to it, uh, about it if you can't see in the back. So basically you have a timeline, right? And that's your life. And conversion happens where it splits. And this is for people who have trusted Christ, that you are saved, okay? And so there's two parts of this line. One is growing awareness of God's holiness, and the other is growing awareness of my flesh and my sinfulness. Now, when we come to faith in Christ, and you really don't dive into God's word, God's word really doesn't have a, a play a big part in your life, gathering with other believers is just, it's secondary at best, well, see, what happens is you're not reminded of God's holiness. And when you're not reminded and consistently taught about how different, how holy, how unique, how set apart God really is, you never see yourself for who you really are. 
You're the complete opposite. I'm the complete opposite of God. I'm, it's not like I'm just better than some people because I'm a pastor. We're all in the same boat. It's God in us. That's it. And so when you don't interact with other believers and you don't get in God's word and you don't work on that relationship, you don't go back to the gospel, guess what happens? That cross never gets any bigger in your life. It never does. And so sometimes people pretend that, you know, I'm better than I actually am, or they try to perform up to where they expect God to see them at. And so they do this balancing act of pretending and performing, and it will wear you out. But yet that cross never changes in your life. And yes, I have buried people. I have put people in the ground, did their funeral service, and that cross never changed in their life. And what a waste. What a waste. They may have been saved, but they never grew. The cross never became bigger in their life. This, that's the problem. The solution is the exact opposite. The next one is this. The solution is when you come to faith in Christ, if you will get into God's word, if you will gather with other believers, you would make this your life because Jesus is your life. Man, the more that you press into God, the more you see how awesome God is, how holy he is. And yet then you see yourself for how sinful you are and all the things you still struggle with. And in the middle of that, it's his grace begins to beam brighter and brighter and brighter. And you're like, why, God, why would you even think about saving someone like me? You remember last week when all this was really about who God is and not who we are? It's all about God's glory. And when God saves sinners like me and you, he alone gets all the glory. Well, when God transforms and sanctifies sinners like you and me, that doesn't bring it on us. That shows who God who he is. So if you wanna grow, if we're gonna have a church that produces work for the kingdom, then man, we gotta keep going back to the cross. We gotta keep going back to the gospel. We never get over the cross. We put ourselves beneath it every single day. So that's the first ingredient in Paul's list of, you wanna have a great church? This is the reason why these Thessalonians had a great church. This is the reason why they impacted their city, even though they were a very small and insignificant church in the eyes of everyone else. It's because their faith produced work. The second ingredient is the why. They were motivated by love. Motivated by love, that's what he says. Your, your, your work is produced by faith. Your labor, that's work again. It's motivated by love. And there's three areas I wanna highlight real quick for you here because I do think they build on one another. First, they're motivated by love because of the example they had set for them by the apostle Paul and Luke and Silas. See, in verse uh, chapter two, if you look down there again, in verse eight, Paul writes this to them. He says, we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become so dear to us. I mean, Paul says, it's not just about my preaching that I wanted to share with you, but we shared our entire lives with you. We lived with you. We communed with you. We prayed with you. We struggled with you. We were there with you the whole time because Paul says, I wanted you to know that it's not just about the words coming out of my lips, but it's the life that has been changed by the gospel. Paul gave them an example to follow. I mean, Paul's genuine love for them became the example that they began to live out for other people. That's what he says in chapter one, verse seven and eight, they became an example. This little bitty church, they made an impact. They became examples in believers all through Macedonia, next door Achaia, and all the other people who had heard about this little church, they became examples to them. I mean, God wants us, he wants you. He wants me to love those who are over us. Specifically here at Highland, God wants us to love our leaders here at Highland. And you guys do a wonderful job at that. Follow their example. Let them love you. Let them teach you. Let them share their lives with you. And the second, because they followed Paul's example, they were also, they loved Jesus. They loved Jesus. That's what they, he says that in chapter four. If you flip over to chapter four, starting in verse one through seven, 
He says, additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that you, as, as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God as you were doing, do this even more. So they're already doing this. For you know what commands we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So how are they loving Jesus? How are they loving God? For this is God's will, your sanctification, your godliness, your growth in godliness, your growth in Christ's likeness that you keep away from sexual immorality, that, you, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor. And he goes on about how they live, right? Is that they were, living, they were loving Jesus by the way they were living for Jesus. Can our lives tell that same truth? By the way we live, does it show that we love Jesus or that we love ourselves, Or that we love something more than Jesus? They were motivated by love. The work they produced was motivated by love. And that a following example of Paul led to them being able to love Jesus better and living that way. But it also allowed them to love other people like God wants us to. Because if you go on down in verses nine, chapter four, verse nine through 12, he says about brotherly love, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught by God to what? Love one another. In fact, you are doing this. First, to all the brothers and sisters in the entire region of Macedonia. But we encourage you, brothers and sisters, to do this even more. So they were loving God's people, whether they fellowship with them on a weekly basis at their church or the greater church in Macedonia. They were loving God's people. But he goes on, he says, so that you may, in verse 12, behave properly in the presence of outsiders. So they were also learning how to love people that weren't in God's family yet. So how are they doing that? That's the list that he, leads, that he lays out. They led a quiet life. They minded their own business. They worked hard with their own hands. That's what they were doing. The Thessalonian Christians worked for the Lord because they genuinely loved the Lord. Do we genuinely love the Lord? And what does our work say about our love for him? Are we the kinds of people who will only do something for Jesus because we get something from Jesus. God doesn't want us to be that way. He wants our work to be motivated by our love for him and others. Paul reminds us in Galatians 5, 6, what matters is faith working itself through love. So we're to, if we're gonna be an impacting kind of church, a great church in God's eyes, then we wanna Work, our work needs to be produced by faith. Our labor needs to be motivated by our love. And then the third ingredient here is the how. Endurance inspired by hope. So back in chapter 1, verse 3, that's what he says in the last part there. Your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. That endurance is not just sitting back waiting on God to do what God's gonna do and I can't do anything about it. That's not the endurance that he's talking about. The endurance that he's talking about is more like the marathon runner, that even though it's tough, even though it's difficult, even though there's a wall that you're hitting, you are patiently waiting for that to end for the runner, but you're still moving forward. You're still moving in a direction that you had began to run. And that's the idea is that in this church, because they were in a predominantly Greek area and they had a strong Jewish community presence there that did not agree with Paul on the gospel of Jesus Christ, they were experiencing persecution. They were experiencing suffering. They were experiencing pushback here, but yet this little church did not give up. They kept on keeping on. They endured. Why did they endure? What was the secret of their endurance? It was their hope in Jesus Christ. It was their hope in that Jesus is who he says he is, that Jesus is going to return one day, that he is going to bring the fruit, the greater fruit of their salvation with him one day. They kept moving forward. Hope is what, hope in Jesus is what gets us up in the morning. I hope it does. Because days are not always fun and the next day doesn't always bring with it wonderful joys in and of itself. But knowing that God is for us, as Romans 8 was just saying, 
Who can be against us? That God promised us in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, the angel said, if you, why are you looking around here? Because if you saw him go that same way, he's coming back the same way. That Jesus has not left us alone. And so when our hope is fixed on Jesus, that he is going to return, that he is working in us and through us, then we can get up every single day and do the things that God has called us to do. The hope that is, inspires our endurance. This church was filled with the hope of Jesus. Those three ingredients, they make for a great church. We see it in Thessalonians and we pray that it's gonna be true here, but we need to, I wanna put this into a statement, maybe that we can begin to remind one another and commit to. Because remember, we're talking about big picture. The big picture vision is this right here. It's on the screen. We exist for God's glory. Highland Baptist Church exists for God's glory. All those years ago, two churches came together to send a team from each church to start this church, not on this location, but the church. And it wasn't for their glory. It wasn't for their accolades. It wasn't for their families or anything like that. It was so that God would be glorified in the new neighborhood called the Highlands. So God planted a church just down the road. That church eventually ended up here, but it was planted. It was started for God's glory and we will continue to exist for God's glory. In fact, I would even say the moment we begin to exist for our own glory is the moment God would not actually help us to exist for his glory. But we exist for God's glory, but what does that mean? What does that look like for our church right now? Here's the vision statement. We desire, we want to see every member, not 90%, not 95%, not even 99%, but if you covenant with this church, number one, you're saying I am saved and we can affirm that, that we know that as best we can, we know you're saved because we've done life with you. We know as best we can, you seem to, to know Jesus as Lord and savior. So we don't want 99%. God doesn't want 99% of the people that are members of this church, covenanted members to agree with this. He wants 100% of people. We wanna see every member of the HBC family growing in Christ likeness, in godliness, right? And on mission in our church, in our homes, in our city and in this world. We'll get to mission in a, in a little bit, but God's vision fuels that mission. And so that's why we're dealing with vision first, but he wants every single person to be consistently growing in him and as we grow in him together, then we're gonna be on mission with him together. And then what that looks like are these next few bullet points. We desire to see a church where every member is engaged in regularly worshiping on Sundays, not once a month, not twice a month, not three times a month, but the church gathering with other believers becomes your top priority. Not because I'm telling you, because you love God and you love his people, that this is the place you wanna be more than anything else. Your calendar begins to revolve around the church, not the other way around. That's the church that is gonna be and make an impact in this world. So we desire to see a church where every member is regularly attending and engaged in worship on Sundays. We desire to see a church where every member participates in at least one mission trip a year. We are working on that, trying to, to, to work that in a financial way to help. I skipped one, let me go back to it. We desire to see a church where every member is actively serving others in the church according to their spiritual gifts. If you don't know what your spiritual gift is, you don't know what those are, that's okay, let's start there. We can help you do that. We desire to see a church where every member gives generously with their time, talents, and finances to fulfill the mission of HBC. We desire to see a church where every member displays great faith in the face of great challenges to the mission. I tell you this time and time again, as we press into the darkness, as we glorify God in all these areas, as we reach people with the gospel, do you think the enemy is going to let up? Absolutely not. In fact, it's gonna get worse because the enemy is losing ground. How the church battles that is faith. We have great faith in these great challenges to the mission. 
And the, and the challenges aren't always, well, we're experiencing spiritual warfare. That's not always the challenges. The challenges could be money. God, we don't have money to do that. And we're talking to the very God who owns everything. Great faith in the midst of great challenges. The next one, we desire to see a church where every member moves the mission forward. How? With their prayer lives. You couple faith and you couple prayer, there is nothing that this church cannot accomplish through God's power and with God's spirit. Do you believe that? Well, 10 of you did. I'm not going to ask it again because then you feel compelled to, well, I got to answer now. But I hope you believe that. I hope we can see you grow in that area, that your prayer lives would grow, your faith would grow. We also, the next one, we desire to see a church where every member is growing in their love for and study of God's word, the Bible. A Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church is the number one thing that this county needs to see God glorified and people come to faith in him. And so we're gonna be that, but we want you to grow with us. We want you to learn God's word, to be consistently devoted to growing in God's word. We also, the next one is we desire to see a church where every member is passionate about seeking the lost and telling them about Jesus. I know that we're not all there yet and that's okay, but these are, this is where we're heading. We wanna see that. That's what God wants to see. We also desire to see a church where every member is not energized for the work by being filled with the Holy Spirit, that this is not on us. We don't have the ability. We don't have the power to reach the lost. Jesus does, and he can do it through the Holy Spirit if we will continually make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit. The deal with all of these, the deal with this is <laughs> you don't have to do any of these things, and I can't make you. God can't make you. This is our responsibility to do these things, to grow in Christ's likeness, to know Jesus and to continue to grow in him. This is where we're headed. This is the why of why we are here. So if we're gonna be a church that makes a kingdom impact in our city and in this world, this is how we do it. This is what is going to make us a great church, not in everybody else's eyes, but in God's eyes one that is fully committed to him. So my challenge for this week for you is very simple. I challenge you to take up this vision and you begin to live it out. You rally around it, you commit to it. We're gonna print this, make sure we do staff that I won't forget. We're gonna print this in the evangel this week the vision and then when we and it will be there every week so you can see it will be on a slide next week that's scrolling through that you can see it will be plastered everywhere eventually to where it reminds us what is our vision here we want to see every member every family member of hbc growing in christ likeness and on mission in our church in our homes in our city and in our world the challenge is rally around that live that out commit to it and so if we're gonna, we're gonna do that, if you're gonna jump on board with what Jesus is doing here, the first thing is, man, you gotta know him. You, you need to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Have you trusted in Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Have you come to the cross and said, I deserve that. I deserve to die. I deserve punishment, but I trust that Christ has taken it for me. If that's you, you've never received forgiveness and salvation then I wanna invite you to do that this morning. In just a few moments, I'm gonna be standing down front. We're gonna stand and sing. As we all sing, you come forward. And all you gotta tell me is just, hey, Brother David, I, I just, I want Jesus. And then I'd love to be able to share with how we could, that could be true in your life today. The second thing is, if you have taken a back seat to your spiritual growth, um, then I wanna challenge you to take up that responsibility that we were just talking about this morning. That work that's produced by faith, the labor that's motivated by love, the endurance inspired by hope in Jesus. If that's you, that you've sort of put your spiritual growth on autopilot and it really hasn't grown very much, I want you to take up the responsibility to partner with God and what he's doing. And we have a fascinating way that you can do that. I know Wednesday nights are not good for everybody, but on Wednesday nights, that's exactly what we're doing right now. When we meet, 
at six o'clock in the fellowship hall. Yes, we have prayer time, but we also spend time learning very practical ways that you could go home and you could begin that night on things that you could begin to do and work on so that you can grow in your spiritual walk with God so that you will continue to mature in your faith. We wanna see every member of the HBC family growing in Christ-likeness and on mission in, in our church, in our homes, in our city, in our world. I pray, I pray, I pray that that will be true for all of us. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the last few moments in your word. Father, we pray that your spirit would and has been speaking to those who, Lord, that are just dry right now in their spiritual walk. Maybe they started January good, but they've already fallen back into just old habits of the things that keep us from being passionate about our walk with you. Lord, would you do that work in them? Would you give them a passion? Would you reinvigorate their spiritual walk? Lord, for those that don't know you, I pray that your spirit has been convicting them of their sin, showing them of their need for Jesus as savior. Lord, and that you have moved him to this point. God, would I pray that they would repent and have faith in Jesus that you would save them today and that we would rejoice along with heaven for another person coming home. Father, we give you this time of response that you would glorify yourself in it. And we ask all of this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. If you would please.